I understand that many of you here are, are here today because you see the things going on around you. And you know that you can just wake up one day and everything's going great, and then you wake up the next day and don't know which direction to turn because we're so dependent upon utilities and we're so dependent upon the system that's been created. So basically when I talk about green living as a refuge for an uncertain future, what I'm saying is that there's not a way to live afraid, but there's a way to live more in control, more in control of yourself, more in control of your life. And really, this is the way our ancestors used to live 100 years ago because they were on farms and they had to be self-dependent in a lot of things. Well, as we quote unquote modernized, we've gone into this rut, this system, this way of doing things. And that system makes us sort of all dependent on certain different things. So if the utilities go out or the water goes bad or this happens, you know, people just can't, it's not like a, it's a minor interruption. It becomes a major thing at that point, you know? And so when we talk about green living as a refuge for an uncertain future, we're saying to people, there's a way for you to enjoy your home and to make changes to your home and make changes to your lifestyle. You're talking about those other things where you're not as dependent upon the present system. So like right now, we're all sitting here and we've got, I don't know how many coal plants and a couple of nuclear plants that are within what, a 200 mile radius of us. And if those things go out, there's all these things that people have to deal with. Okay, less noise and stuff. Okay, so this is the, what we're talking about. Now what we provide as a company are systems. And those before we get into talking about those systems, we wanna talk about how to make your home green, okay? Now you might say, why do you listen to us? Well, we've been around for 36 years, a very small company. The owner of this company, uh, when he went to school at Berkeley, became a member of a commune and lived in a big redwood tree. <laughs> and so we've got that liberal side. Me on the other side, I was sort of raised in a black Baptist church and felt like I was going to go in the ministry. And, you know, so we had all these things going. And so I'm a talker. You have to watch me because after two hours, I say, we're beginning to close. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the Baptist route. But anyway, but I had a business and Gil started this business. I joined him 10 years ago working as a consultant in his office and we became business partners. And I am glad that I got involved in this because I like passion. I like to believe in something that I am doing. And we are very passionate about this and about what's going on. Next slide, please. Now I want to ask you all a question. What do each one of you, or what do you think, let's just get three or four answers, what do you think is wrong with this picture? Anyone? They're not energy efficient, but what's just normal about that? What, when you look at that, what looks wrong about that picture to you? Yes, they are very, very close together. You notice that they aren't oriented towards the sun or the wind. They're oriented towards profit. How many, how, how many houses can I stick in this piece of property and make gazillions of dollars? That's why they're built that way. Notice that this one is made out of wood. There's nothing wrong with wood. You know, one thing that I found, and we come into this difficulty with people who are in the, on the green side, some of them are just tree huggers and you can't touch a tree or a bush and don't move that blade of grass. It has a life of its own. And it's kind of like, OK, <laughs> now everything's talking, everything's thinking. I don't know if we can handle all of this. But the whole point is, is that in our in our world, we take advantage of things. We go too far. I believe the biblical thing that man is the ruler of the world. But aren't you supposed to rule things well? Aren't you supposed to manage? You know what I'm saying? So when they cut down all these trees, they just cut the, they just mowed the forest down. And they didn't think about putting the trees back. Someone had to make them think about where they're going to get trees from next. You know, when they build houses, let's have the next slide, please. What is renewable and sustainable living? How is it unique? It is really your great grandpa's farming lifestyle. I said on technology steroids, but that's not really true either. 
A lot of things are just good common sense, taking care of your resources. And one thing that we have done with the built environment is we have separated it from nature. And what your grandpa did is he understand, understood everything he did went back to the soil, back to the air, back to the sun. And so they thought about those things all the time. When they built a barn, the north side of the barn didn't have any windows in it. So there would be a windbreak in the wintertime. They planted trees a certain way. You know, they put porches around their house. So like in the summer, when the sun would rise, they'd be on the west side of the house enjoying the cool porch. And in the evening, they'd be on the east side of the house <laughs> enjoying the cool porch. And that's how they got their air conditioning. That's why they didn't have air conditioning. Um, the next slide, please. So when you understand the green built environment, first thing that you need to understand is that until the 1960s or 70s, every building had windows that opened. It had smaller floor plans and floor footprints, so the air would move through it and around it. It was oriented, not so much commercial, but homes. People would orient their homes to the sun and the wind and the ground so that the house because they didn't have a lot of things to keep the house warm. You know, they used potbelly stoves and fireplaces. So they used everything they could in nature to keep the house to be a comfortable environment for them all year, on, all year round. And they had utilization of the winds too. And that's something that you notice even now in homes. You know, until the 60s and 70s, when they started building houses that were just a box with glass all around them and buildings that were glass all around them. You know, you would have your doors and your windows set up so you'd open this door on this side of the house and this window on this side of the house and the air would blow through. So that's a lot of what the green environment is. Next slide, please. Okay, if you look at this particular home, you've got an evergreen here and you've got a, probably a maple or something over there and you see the porch. During the summertime, they got shade. During the wintertime, they got sun. It, during the summertime, they got shade here. During the wintertime, it blocked the winds. Okay, so this helped protect this house so they didn't have to use so much energy. Look at the small floor footprint, and it went up instead of spreading out. Okay, so I guess if you say, what is the reason why you should listen to what I have to say is I used to live this way. I was raised this way, and I liked it. <laughs> I didn't dislike it. It was very enjoyable way of living. The next slide, please. So when you look at how you can make it without calling us, how can I make my house more green? You can landscape, landscape for comfort and food, planting trees for shade, windbreaks and food, building close to natural water sources or woods. People used to actually build their homes and they build them next to a creek or they had a well or they knew where the water table was. All these things people did and it made them self-sufficient in their home and it made their home less, if there was any kind of catastrophe, any kind of problem, their lifestyle was not as affected, okay? Um, they, they were building in harmony with the natural topography instead of mowing things down. I don't know if many of you are aware of Johnson County, but Every time you see a building in Johnson County, there probably was either a hill or a creek or something there. And they are masters at flattening everything and filling everything in and then putting a building on top of it. They don't build with the natural rolling hills. And you wouldn't think that there's a lot of natural rolling hills, but in Wyandotte and Johnson County, there were. Uh, one of the reasons why they have a lot of water problems, water mitigation problems, is because all through Johnson and Wyandotte County were creeks. And after you mow over enough of them and knock down enough hills, when it rains, the water doesn't have anywhere to go. <laughs> and so it rolls off the parking lots and it fills up those storm drains and they've just taken people away, you know, because there's so much water in them. Okay, so uh, we encourage the indigenous use of plants and wildlife as a part of a living property. That's another thing that we've done is, um, again, that's a part of the 60s and 70s. People started having landscaping because it looked good. And the first thing my grandpa said, well, what are they going to eat? Because <laughs> if you spent all that money on landscaping, you should have been able to get some fruit out of it. That's the way he thought about it. All right. Next slide, please. 
Then the next thing is the natural use of green space. One thing that we do not realize is that the earth itself is a breathing animal. And so all of that land, the way the water goes down in the, in the, in the land, purifies the water. And the way the wind blows over it, all of that evaporation and all of that absorption, it is of great benefit to you as a person. And you need to take advantage of that. That's where your food comes from. That's where your water comes from. That's where your air comes from. So when they do things like parking lots and roads, they stop all of that. They stop the natural flow of, of nature. And when they take away from people their yards and their green spaces, that's why you have heat islands inside of the city. You go in the city and it's just like it never cools off. And these 110 degree days we've had, it's just been stifling, you know, and that's because you don't have any natural greening. Um, then, uh, so it uses a, as a heat shield, water purification, water infiltration, and keeping natural ground cover for its benefits. Okay. The next thing is, next slide please. Under natural access to water is this. People used to capture rainwater. Rainwater is just one of the best kinds of water that there is around for your gardens and everything else. And it stops you from using all the fluoride and all the chlorinated water that comes from the city for a lot of different things. So if we can capture this natural access and put in rain barrels, and also we'll talk a little bit about gray water too, you do those kinds of things and you're able to recycle the use of the water just like the earth does. So what happens is you're using water in such a way that you're not taking or stealing from the natural environment, but you're working with it. And you can use that water over and over again. It's running off of your house, down the street and into the gutter, and it goes away. Then they go and suck it out and put it back. You know, it's much better if you just take it off the roof, if you can, and utilize it. And so one thing about Rita's house is she actually has a cistern under the ground and she captures rainwater and uses it to water her uh, yard. Well, you can capture that rainwater and use it to drink, use it for plantings, use it for gardening, use it for uh, cleaning your clothes, all kinds of things. It can be filtered and utilized for all kinds of things. Then the next slide, please. Another thing is natural waste disposal. And that's everything from outhousing and composting toilets, composting for the gardening, secondary uses of gray, wa of gray water. What is gray water? Basically, in your sewer system, you have two kinds of water. You have the sewage or the septic side, which is, of course, human waste and those things. Then you have gray water. And that's everything that comes out of your garbage disposal, out of your sinks, uh, out of your different vanities. You can capture that and you can filter it or you can use it on your garden. The only thing you have to be careful of is if you're using natural biodegradable soaps. So if you use those things to wash your body, wash your dishes, you take advantage of that gray water and you use it again. So again, that's lowering your dependence upon the utilities and making yourself more independent. And, you know, you're, you're also uh, feeding yourself. You're also providing for yourself and for your home and, and, uh, with the very water you have, you're making uses of it, just like your grandparents did when they, because you know why they, they used water frugally, because when they ran out, they had to go get some more. <laughs> and they didn't want to do all that walking, so they said, wait a second, before you throw that out, let's put that over here. Uh, next thing, please. Next slide. Okay, another thing is, is what Rita did is she made some architectural changes to her house. Let me sort of explain this. Um, what heating and air conditioning and energy so much is about is thermodynamics. And what thermodynamics is, is when something is cold, it's looking for warmth so it can rush to where that warmth is. And when something is hot, it's looking for cold so it can cool itself down. So that's a natural movement of air, a natural movement of temperature, because everything wants to equal itself out, just like water finding its own level. So when you look at thermodynamics, when you're sitting inside of your home, your home is like an oversized coat that you're putting on. When you are standing in a room, you are at like 93 degrees in your body temperature. Let's say outside it's 10 degrees. Well, that's an 83 degree temperature differential between your body and what's going on outside. What is going on outside is once your body becomes aware that, hey, there's 10 degrees out there 
your temperature of your body starts to go outside so that it can equalize temperature. It actually draws the heat right out of you because you're the warmest thing in the room. And that's the way thermodynamics works. That's why when you fire up a fireplace, they tell you be careful how you fire up a fireplace. Well, it'll get so hot in the fireplace, suddenly that air is rushing to go outside. Well, it'll pull all the heat right out of your house <laughs> while it's going outside to get cool again. So how do we use thermodynamics? We use them by building our homes a certain way. When she was talking about insulating, there's something, uh, I don't want to make a squeal or something, but if you stand over there and you touch that wall, there's something called dark heat transfer. I think those are the right words for it. If I am 93 degrees and the wall is 40 degrees because it's not properly insulated, even though I have 70 degree temperature in here, the heat in my body is going, ah, 40 degrees, let's move over there. And it's drawing the heat right out of my body. So people walk around inside of a, a house, they feel cold. Why do you feel cold? Because if you're not able to insulate your body from the exterior, your warm body is looking at that 10 degrees and going, ah, heat, let's go over there, boy, get cooled off. It's warm over here. So people don't realize that when you insulate your home, actually you feel more comfortable and you can turn down your thermostat and use less energy and you're more comfortable in your home. Another thing that's important, we did this with a person who had a heating and air conditioning problem. They said, we've never been warm in our house, never. Well, not only did we increase the BTUs of their furnace, we added a steam humidification system that actually raised the humidity in the room. And warm air, moist air, holds heat better than dry air. You walk in their house, you touch the floor, you touch the walls, warm. They said this is the warmest we've ever been. They say we've never felt like we could walk around in our underwear. We always had to wear sweats or something. Now we can walk around, we're always comfortable. And they had their thermostat turned down to 68. And you walked in there and it was just like a big, somebody threw a big warm blanket on you. Boy, it felt good, you know. So having the right heating and ventilation and air conditioning system can save you money because it makes you comfortable in your house. Well, a lot of times when we have these HVAC systems or other things put in, they're put in on the cheap. People are in a hurry. They don't actually have their home looked at to find out exactly what your home needs. So, you know, they're just putting them out like boxes. And so people end up with some systems sometimes that don't work for them, especially depending on how much heat is coming in because of the sun or because of the wind, how much cool is coming in. So it's important that you have those things looked at. And we all spend money on these things. So it's not something that you have to do today. It's something you plan in your mind. When I'm ready to change out my heating and air conditioning system, I want to make sure that it is customized to my home that I've got the right amount of circulation, that I've got the right equipment, that it's energy efficient. Because what that means is you means that you get to turn down your thermostat and you enjoy your home more. One thing about Rita is she was saying, talking about the draftiness of her home, she actually enjoys her house more. She sits there and the wind isn't blowing across her neck or whatever is going on. And and it's just nice. You just sit there and you don't use that much energy and you feel good. And that's another thing about uh, the green built environment. It is designed to make you feel like you're outdoors when you're indoors, yet it's blanketing you. So that means you get sunlight to read by instead of these kinds of lights. You get air uh, from being in the country. OK, from being in the country. Um, good Lord. Are we at 30 seconds or 30 minutes? 30 minutes, okay. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> we better get trucking. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, we do need to get trucking. But um, as we look at this, you know, it's just the things that you do. And you do them, you can do a lot of them yourself. And the thing that's important about that is if you take care of your home and making it more in tune with the environment and a less of an energy user, then when you contact us, you don't have to spend as much money because you're not using as much energy. You know what I'm saying? And so that helps, you know, or when you get the equipment 
and you put it in, it doesn't take as much power to use it. And over a long period of time, those savings add up. And that means that, you know, you're paying yourself instead of paying the utility company. And that makes a big difference. Uh, use of natural lighting, use of natural air flows, uh, understanding the interior of the built environment. The building is part of nature. One thing that you'll find out about uh, the entire green movement, and I'm my only concern about the green movement is I heard Mr. Leverett talking about how you just do things because you're doing things and it's simple and you just get into it. Sometimes when you get into things like this, it was technology that kind of got us in trouble. You know, we, we had cheap electricity and we said, well, let's just make a 10 story building and wrap it in glass. And doesn't it look cool? You know, and we did all of that stuff and we spent a lot of money on it. And a lot of times people want to solve the problem by spending more money. <laughs> and I don't know if that's always the way to do it. Sometimes you have to look at the technology and pick what is right for you. Whether it's $50 or $5 or $5,000, whatever works within your budget and whatever works for your particular situation. Okay? So the benefits of a green home are comfort, it being natural, it being energy efficient, and there being lower energy demand means a smaller energy production system. So we've talked about how a natural home lives and breathes and it just requires less energy and it requires less of everything. So then when you go to do things to this home like HVAC and electrical production and all those things, then you can look at different systems. You can look at smaller systems and that makes a difference on your budget. All right. Next slide, please. Get professional help and guidance. One of the things is if we see that what we're doing is like being caught in a web, how do you get out of it? Well, you have to know what is happening to you so you can figure out kind of how to undo it. So I would suggest that you get a good energy efficiency auditor contractor. We don't do that, but we know people who do that. And basically, if they come to your home and they say, you know, air is leaking out that window. Well, you can't see it. You know, maybe you can feel it, but you don't know how to stop it. Maybe maybe you need more insulation on that wall. They, can, they have uh, cameras that they can shoot at different things and they see the heat and the cool as it's coming and going. So you get those people and they're able to, if they know their business well, they're able to tell you what is wrong or right with your house. And once you get that information, then you can decide how you're going to fix it. That way you're not just like throwing money like spaghetti on a wall and hoping something will stick. You know what the problem is and you know how to go about it. So they give you important data about your home and give you guidelines on your needs. And the most important thing that they do is they come back after the work is done by other contractors and tell you, Yes, he stopped that wall from leaking, or yes, he made that wall warmer, or they stopped that window from leaking, okay? Um, so facts don't lie, and it's important to get those facts. It's just like going to a doctor and getting a checkup. Take your home and have it checked up. Um, then the next thing, next slide, please. Uh, making your home more efficient. We use a lot of power for lighting. So compact fluorescence, LED light bulbs, opening the shades on the windows, all of these things, you know, when you have a window that isn't leaking energy, now come wintertime, you want to open that sucker up and enjoy the light and look outside and hope you don't have to go out there and shovel that snow. <laughs> That's what kids are for. Go. <laughs> go and earn. I've been feeding you all year. Go. <laughs> So you get the efficient lighting, insulation, you eliminate drafts, your home is more energy efficient. Next slide, please. Other things we can do, she talked about caulking and sealing, windows, doors, eliminating cracks in the envelope and ductwork. Let's just talk for a second about the envelope. I talked to you a little bit about thermodynamics. One thing that's very important is they do not build houses so that they're alive. Okay, if you have a, let's say you have a two-story house with an attic. What's going on in the attic is very different from what's going on in the basement. Really, really different. And what they used to do is they would build houses with 
like holes in the floor. This is what greenhouses are. So actually you can use the cool air from the basement to help condition the first and the second floor. And they know how to ventilate the, 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 the attic. And there's something called an ice house roof, which actually ventilates air over your rooftop or up under your rooftop. And it keeps from transferring the heat that just is pounding on top of your roof from going in your house. All of these technologies, quote unquote, that's why I talked about technology steroids that might not be true. Ice house roof, they called it an ice house roof because people used to use ices, ice blocks of ice. So your refrigerator was called an ice box because they would come by. We uh, have done a lot of buildings in the inner city. There's actually holes in some of the walls where they would open up the door and slide the ice in. And that went into your ice box. Okay, so an ice house roof is from the 1900s. In the 1800s, they just stopped doing it. You know, just like you drive down the street and you look at these beautiful old buildings and you realize the people who built those buildings are dead and probably few people are alive who know how to reproduce what they did. So the knowledge gets lost from generation to generation. So if we bring that knowledge, what, what the green and the environmental community is saying is let's bring back that knowledge add it to the technology we have, lower our carbon footprint, lower our energy usage, and make that an advantage for us. And like right now, this is just a little political statement, you know, they're talking about high unemployment. If we really had leaders in Washington who realized all the things we need to do to reinvent ourselves and help the next generation, we wouldn't have unemployment, we'd have full employment, you know, and we'd be doing things that actually help us and actually add to the economy in the future. But you know, they bail out Wall Street. But anyway, that's another story. Next slide, please. Here's uh, energy efficient appliances. You know that now they make refrigerators that are more energy efficient. Everything toasters. This is called a tankless hot water system. And, the, and so one of the inefficiency of, uh, inefficiencies of a hot water system is you've got all that water sitting there. The thermodynamics is the hot water wants to, the heat wants to go out here and let the water get cool. Well, when you have the instant hot water heaters, when you ask for hot water, it fires up and it heats it up as it goes through. So you get like instant hot water. So here's a, that's just another area where you can make your house more energy efficient. A lot of the technology is there. And here's another thing that's important. As this technology is being revived and used, the price of it goes down and it becomes more reasonable to use. So you know, the solar panel, panels become more efficient. Everything works better because they're focusing on it. And that's another reason why the people in the, in the, from the green movement are saying, hey, government, let's go ahead and subsidize this. Let's push this because as it's subsidized, the price of things goes down as they work out all the kinks and they begin to work on the technology because of demand. So that's just using the free enterprise system to push the technology along. Next slide, please. One thing that Grandpa always said, turn out the light if you're not in the room. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many businesses save thousands of dollars on their light bill by changing the type of light bulb and the type of uh, um, transformer it uses and actually having a switch where when people walk out of the room, the lights turn themselves off. You wouldn't believe it. Thousands and thousands of dollars. It's so just amazing. Programmable thermostats, you can do that with your home, you can do that with your business. Occupancy controls, turn things off. And uh, basically just using power for your benefit. You're saying to yourself, that light is on, I'm not in the room, I'm not benefiting from it, let's just turn the light off. You know. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Now we're finally into the things that we sell, the stuff that we do. First, I wanted to talk about the background technology that brings us to what we do. Because this costs money, you know, one thing I, uh, I, don't, I don't like to run from the money subject because it eventually comes up. What we like to do, we like to call ourselves a parlor company, and we do that for one simple reason. We like to sit down and talk to people. What do you need? 
What do you want? And we try to find a good budget for them. We know that people want to get more than one quote, and that's good chopping sense, you know. But when you sit down and talk to people, what we would like to think, and I know this sounds corny, but we would like to be your friend who recommends to you. It's just like you have a relative. Maybe her name is Susie. And you, you were going to buy that cheaper car. And she said, no, no, no. You know you drive a lot and you got the kids. and get Pay that extra $1,000 and get that car. She bent your ear till you got it. And then you said, boy, I'm glad I bought that car. Or else you were going to buy something for a car that was $15,000. Oh, you're wasting your money. You don't need to do all that. Get your used car. Do this and that. And you listen to that good advice and you go, Boy, I'm glad I saved that money. And this older car actually runs better than the one that was two years newer because it's better built, you know. So it's not just a matter of how much do you pay. What we call it is value. We try to find a way to fill people's uh, expense cost with value because what matters is what did you get out of it? It's not how much did you spend. It's not how much profit did we make. It's what did you get out of it? And was it worth you spending your money on? Okay. Now, what we provide to people are grid tie, off grid, and hybrid power production systems. And what those are is very simple. We are using the power of the sun, the same way it heats your home and all the thermodynamics. We're using that to create for you hot water, to create for you electricity, and and to uh, allow you to be more independent. And so, after you've done these other things that are helping you, and and I want to say honestly. All the stuff I've talked about before, I felt compelled to do that to sort of bring you into our world and what we see. And also, these things, the first things, have the greatest return on investment for you. When you spend money on those things, you will spend less money and lower your bills or lower your costs more. So they save you a lot of money. But then when you get to these things, these things produce electricity and uh, they produce power for you. And the thing is, is the return on investment, in all honesty, may not be there in your mind. But always remember, the cost of energy continues to rise. And uh, KCPNL has already had a good jump in their rate, haven't they? And uh, they're asking for more. So I'm sure that a year from now, or two years from now, we'll be paying significantly more. Same way with the gas company. So actually, they found a lot of gas. We don't know how that's going to go. But the whole point is, is they still charge you for finding it. So we'll figure out how they're going to work with that. But anyway, what grid tie is, is we're taking solar panels and we're putting them on your house and we're connecting them to a grid. We put in an inverter. Solar panels, solar PV creates DC power. And what you want to do is turn that into AC power so that you can use it in your home. So alternating and direct current. So what the grid tie system does is the panels are sitting on top. The sun shines on them. They produce electricity, which is DC. They turn that DC into AC and they feed it into your, into your panel. The reason why they call it grid tie is because your panel is connected to the grid and there's no break between ours and the grid. So there's certain safety functions that are inside of a grid tie system so that if the power goes down in your neighborhood, you're not producing power and you're going to shock somebody who's uh, working on the power grid down the, down the block trying to fix things. So there's certain safety. Everything is, is safety uh, involved in these things. But that's what grid tie does. What off grid is, is it's making power for you and you're not attached to the grid. So it's able to produce power for you. We've created off grid systems for people like on a Bahamian island and in the backwoods of... Uh, uh, of the Redwood Forest of California. Uh, the utility wanted to charge them $100,000 to bring a power line to their house. They got a grid tie system. People on a Bahamian island, there's no grid there. So we went there and we set up a off-grid system. So when you set up these systems, everything that we do is utility grade uh, so that you don't even know that you're not on the utility. When you look at your when you turn on your television, to use a phone, you don't know that your power system is working. That's why we have that little display in, in her room, because I mean, in her uh, dining room. If it wasn't there, she wouldn't know whether she was producing her own electricity or getting it from the utility. But she can look at that and say, wow, I'm using my own electricity today. I'm not using any of the utility's electricity. Or, wow, I'm, I'm sending you uh, electricity back to the utility. So, and then hybrid... 
Hybrid means that you use battery systems and a combination of different power production systems, which is solar power and wind turbines, and also something we call hydro, uh, micro hydro turbines. Um, the total utility system is, for that person that's on the Bahamian Islands, when we got finished putting in their utility system, there, when you walked into their kitchen, it looked just like yours. Had the same phone that you have, same communications you have. They bought their, they, they put refrigerators on the boat from Home Depot and shipped them over there and unloaded them. So they got stoves and everything, just like you do. Well, that's what happens when you create these systems. They're seamless. Now, one thing you have to realize is that they do require a certain amount of maintenance, like checking the batteries. Rita checks her batteries on a regular basis once a month and just make sure there's plenty of water in the batteries, tops them off a little bit. Uh, if you have a, a, a total system that has in it a generator, you have to make sure you got fuel, make sure the generator has oil. And all these things are done and they're almost invisible to you. Community power is when several families all get together, like if they live on a lake, and say, you know, let's put up a couple of wind turbines and put on solar panels and we'll produce our own power. And they can do that and we can set that up. And it would be just like here except they wouldn't be attached to a grid. Or they could be attached to a grid as a backup. So there's many ways to alter the system for you. Community water is where you go to a, a couple of wells. We're able to draw the water out of the wells through solar panels, pump it into cisterns, filter it out of the cisterns. You don't know. You go to your, your bathroom and turn on the water, it's just like a utility system, okay? And community sewage treatment is the opposite. You take all the affluent, uh, I'm not affluent, but anyway, uh, all of the sewage <laughs> and you filter it and you, and you compost it and people don't know. I mean, you can actually make these systems micro systems. Next slide, please. Um, micro hydro is something very simple. The, the movement of water can uh, produces power, kinetic energy. It can be turned into electricity. And so if you have a stream that's constantly running on your property, you can actually put one of those in. Next slide, please. This is a barn that's a grid tie system in, in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. This gentleman has a barn. His house is back over this way. And we were able to install 8, kilo, eight, eight kW of solar panels on his south-facing barn roof. And that feeds back into his main system and it cut his utility bills. Now there are also presently governmental um, credits and tax credits and so on and so forth that you can use that can cut the price of these systems significantly. As a matter of fact, we can get below the direct cost to you below 50%. Next slide, please. The cost of these systems depends on what you, what you desire. They can go, we, if we have a backup generator for when the power goes out, we have backup home standby generators that come on within 30 seconds and you're back in power again. Uh, and we also can do these kinds of systems. So the price ranges start from about 6,000 and they go up to whatever, wherever you want to go with them. Her system came out at over 35,000, is that right, altogether? With the batteries and everything else. She has, a, uh, she has what you call a hybrid system, but it's still attached to the grid. She has batteries in their basement. Next slide, please. Here's her battery box that was made by us on top of a concrete footing. And those are her inverters. So basically the inverters take the DC energy, turn it into AC. First they take the DC and they charge her batteries, then they turn it into AC, they feed her house. If power should ever go out, it reverts back to the batteries and she's on battery power. And it pulls the DC back out of the batteries, inverts it again, and now she has her television and whatever else she needs to maintain during a power outage. Next slide, please. Uh, that's solar off-grid. That's that Bahamian Island we talked about. Next slide, please. Off-grid system, solar panels, inverters, batteries. There was also a generator involved. Next slide, please. It also has a generator. And on this one, they had propane. Back up one more slide right quick. That was, that's the propane, and there's the generator. So that was a diesel generator, and some of them used propane. So you can actually mix a, gener a generator in with wind turbines and with solar panel, that inverter pulls in power from all of those things. It will kick on your generator if your batteries get too low. So literally, like I said, it's just like this room. You don't realize you're not on a utility. Next slide, please. 
This is a home backup system and that is a portable generator system. So if it's within your budget and you have like $2,000, you can get a generator, a backup generator. You can also set that up electrically in your home so you can just plug it into an outlet on the outside of your house. And if there's a power outage, you can flip circuits over to that and you have power in your home. Next slide, please. These are wind turbines. And the thing about a wind turbine is you want to get it high enough. You see how it's above the trees? So if they're high enough above trees and above buildings around it, you can get sufficient power from those. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a water treatment system. And this is a cistern system. Uh, that's one on the outside of a house. And uh, basically, again, they're drawing water from the rooftops. Next slide, please. All right. The most important thing about green and renewable is it is a great quality of life. It's not just saving energy. It's being in tune with nature. It's building your house or rebuilding your house or looking at your house again as a part of nature instead of separate from it and using nature to help you. And it allows you, if there is any kind of power outage or catastrophe, you know, I mean, if the tornado hits your house, I guess all things are out at that particular point, <laughs> the generator and all the rest of it. But the whole point is, is things that happen across town, things that happen to the grid system that we are so intertied into, those things don't have as much of an effect on you. And for many people, that's a sense of security and peace for them. Uh, one thing that we found about, one thing that we do a lot of is retrofitting to people's homes, okay? One thing that we have also noticed is that as you go forward, the technology is just amazing and the way it just pushes forward, okay? So let's say uh, five years ago, geothermal was like three times more efficient than any other system out there. And I mean, it was just amazingly efficient. In just the last two years, they have made heat pumps like uh, sear ratings of 24 and a half. Now they're expensive, you know what I'm saying? But the whole point is, is for many of our customers that are in the, six, in the, in the city, you can get a 16 sear air conditioner and you can retrofit what you have with that. And another thing that's a problem with people's homes is you didn't have the home properly engineered as far as ductwork is, is concerned. And we're talking about thermodynamics and air movement. So, you know, sometimes if people look at the dollars and they say, what is the best use of dollars? They might say, I think I'll go with that 16 sear heat pump system and do this and do that. Because it's all choice and dollars. And when you look at the, the, the um, geothermal, that is really great for people who are out in the country. I've heard of people with big houses having like under $50 a month energy bills because of those things. So they can be very efficient. But again, you need to do the engineering and look at the numbers. And that's what we do all the time. Any other questions? Because there's a lot of options. And one thing that we do is we present people with different options and then let them decide you know, what is best for them or what makes the most sense for him. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Actually, solar panels are tougher than your roof. So if your solar panels get damaged, it's going to tear up your roof anyway. And if the wind comes and snatches the solar panels off your roof, it was going to snatch your roof off anyway. <laughs> So they they are extremely tough, and we use uh, different uh, panel systems, different uh, uh, systems to hold them to the roof. So literally, to take the solar panel off your roof is a whole lot of weather, and it's going to take those, you know, you don't have to worry about the solar panel being weaker than your roof. If it takes the solar panels, it's taking the roof. So that's all there. And here's another thing that's important, too. She had to find an insurance company that would insure her, her solar panels. And another thing that's important, and this is the thing about the government and asking questions and getting, see, they try to act like this doesn't exist because they don't want you to have it. <laughs> and the utilities fight it and this, that, and the other. But as it goes forward, 
you know, the insurance companies pick it up, the construction companies are, are working with us on it, you know, and there's less resistance to this kind of uh, technology being implemented. Any other questions? Yes. Wind turbines, yes. When you look at all of those things, the first thing that you have to do is you have to actually have us or a do-it-yourself find out what is your natural resource. Depending on where you are, wind turbines may not be good for you because it's how often does the wind blow and how fast does it blow. You get out to western Kansas and they have a constant wind and when you get above the earth, like when you get like 60 feet, 80 feet up there, there's a constant wind going over your head. Well, if you're in Missouri, you can go up 100 feet. There's just nothing up there, you know. So you have to find out exactly where you are. But wind turbines can produce more power per dollar spent than solar panels can. The problem with wind turbines is there's not always wind but there's always sun. I mean, most of the time there's sun. And when you, the way that we install wind turbines, the way that we wire them up, actually on gray winter days. Well, let's put it this way. The best time for a solar panel to produce electricity is on a cold, sunny winter day. They actually outproduce their ratings. So like in the, in the, in the fall and winter when it's cool and she's got sun, Oh, she's making electricity like crazy. So you've always got sun. And so even in a, in, on a cloudy day, you'll produce electricity. So that's the, the benefit. Now, the, the, the only uh, fault of solar panels is come nightfall, there's no solar. <laughs> After it gets dark, you know, it doesn't produce any more electricity. But come bright and early in the morning, it'll start up again. Yes, sir. Actually, we have you have a 30% tax rebate, and I believe that goes to 2016, isn't it now, or 2013? Okay, well they extended that, so so you're going to get a 30% tax rebate until the teens. I think it's 13 or 16. So what that means is a rebate means that it goes beyond zero. So let's say you spent $30,000 on a solar system and you get 30% of that back. And that's equipment, installation, all of it. So whatever our contract is, you get 30% of that back. Well, then that lowers your out-of-pocket expense. Because if you have a $30,000 system and let's say you're going to get $10,000 back, but your taxes are $4,000, they send you a check for $6,000. You understand? So it goes beyond whatever your tax burden is. And that's true for businesses as well as for individuals. Now, in the state of Missouri, they're also giving a $2 per watt rebate if you are attached to Kansas City Power and Light. So all the way up to a 25 kW system, which, is, which would be $50,000 per individual. So you take whatever the cost of your system is how many watts it gets derated to based upon its production. And that's about 96% based upon the efficiency of our equipment of whatever it's rated. And you multiply that times $2 per watt and you come up with some cash. And uh, also the way we engineer our systems and the way we wire them and, and configure them, thank you very much. Uh, it allows us to actually start getting power early in the morning before the sun is at its fullest. You know, so I mean... I would say if the sun starts to come out at 6 o'clock by 6.30, you're cranking out energy. And if the sun disappears behind the hill at 9 o'clock, at 8 o'clock, you're still cranking out energy. So that's the way we configured the system so it would be able to do that. Well, I want to ask you guys, I feel like I've rattled on and probably had this too long, too many things to cover in, in such a period. Did you, did you learn anything? Did I confuse anybody? Okay, great. Did you enjoy it? I enjoy talking to you guys. Thank you.